So it looks like uh, we're going to get going. Uh, hi and welcome. My name is Ricardo Bayon. I work with a group called Echo Asset Management Partners. I'm going to turn it to my co-panelists to have them introduce themselves. But before I do that, I wanted to just uh, set a series uh, of ground rules. But I don't want it to sound very formal. They're not really rules. Because what I actually want this to be is a no rules, no holds barred discussion. There's enough of you that we can actually have this kind of discussion. So uh, knowing that it's after lunch, it's the evening, many of you have been staring out at the Golden Gate and wishing you were out there uh, rather than in a room. Uh, I figured that I wasn't going to let any of my panelists put up PowerPoint presentations. And, and Peter begged and begged and begged, but I told him, no way, no PowerPoint presentations for you. So he may have a little PowerPoint withdrawal. But the idea is um, that we have a conversation. Uh, and I was selected for this job, Lee tells me, because I'm uh, annoying enough to, to be up here and bug people. So uh, my job is to not let people ramble on, to interrupt them, to ask them hard questions, and to just generally be my own annoying self. So I guess um, I won't date myself by saying Phil Donahue, uh, but uh, essentially what we're trying to be here is kind of like, I don't know, what would be the equivalent nowadays? Uh, Geraldo Rivera is still too old? I don't know, you're young, Eric. What, what's, the, what's the YouTube equivalent of a talk show host these days? Uh, who knows? But the point is, this is more of a talk show than a series of presentations. So you don't have to wait for any Q&A session to raise your hands and ask questions. If you have a burning question, raise your hand. Uh, I will try and call on you. Um, but please, wait and hold your fire until you get a mic, because this is being recorded, so we want to get it on the microphone. Um, and our subject is the evolution of conservation finance. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about is sort of the past, present, and future of conservation finance. And we have a, a great panel up here to talk about that. And I'll pass the mic to uh, have them introduce themselves. And I'll try not to be annoying when they do. John? My name is John Tobin. I work at Credit Suisse based in Zurich. Uh, where I have uh, global responsibilities for sustainability at the, at the financial institution. Uh, much of that has to do with risk, risk management, but increasingly uh, uh, we're getting involved on the opportunity side of sustainability and uh, conservation finance is a topic we are uh, getting actively involved in. So uh, can everybody see my PowerPoint? No. Uh, so my name is Peter Stein. I'm one of the managing directors of something called the Lime Timber Company. We're a private equity fund structure that invests in high conservation value forests. Um, I'm the old person here, not just on the panel, in the room, at the conference, in San Francisco, no. Um, and uh, I've been doing land conservation for exactly 41 years. Hi, I'm Susan Finney-Silver. I'm at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and I manage our PRI program, Program Related Investments. And about half of actually both our grant making and our investing are in the conservation and climate arena. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here as well. My name is Eric Halstein. I work with the Nature Conservancy, and I work with an initiative that we have called NatureVest, which is an initiative to take the 3,500 employees roughly that we have the projects around the world and the $6 billion balance sheet and look at how we can leverage private capital to achieve conservation objectives. And so we're interested in impact investing and investing in conservation investing from the perspective of uh, what can we achieve in terms of the fisheries improved, uh, the miles of riparian habitat improved, and the conservation outcomes and look at investing as a mechanism, as a tool for doing that. Great. So we'll start. We'll start off with, with, with a question for, for John. Um, John, uh, along with Peter and a bunch of other folks around the room, Susan, even Eric, uh, were involved in a, a report that came out recently that Credit Suisse did with WWF on conservation finance. I was going to ask ta John to tell us a little bit about his involvement in that, what the findings of the report are, and, and then to follow up with a bit of a question on why is a big bank like Credit Suisse getting involved in this? What's the interest there? 
Uh, thanks. Well, uh, a couple thoughts on that. Uh, in terms of um, the e e principal findings, I have to say that what strike us the, struck us the most about the work that we did is, was that in the process of interviewing especially high net worth individuals for uh, our data collection process, we were struck by how much interest there was in environmental impact investing. Uh, social impact investing is probably a decade ahead of uh, environmental impact investing. There is a much greater diversity and number of financial products available for investors on the social side than on the environmental side. And to our surprise, there was a you know, huge interest on the part of people, uh, in, again, particularly private high net worth individuals in being able to put some of their wealth into, these, in, in, into this area. Uh, the, the reality is that the avail availability of products is limited and that's something that we need to work on. Uh, maybe the other finding that I would like to highlight is the fact that um, ultimately the story of conservation may be a happy one. Uh, a re relatively happy one at least, if we're able to bring private capital to bear. Uh, and, and why do I say that? As part of this study, we took a look at what the conservation needs are globally. Uh, and we came up with an estimate based on, you know, a consensus number of three to four hundred billion dollars per year that are uh, required in, that would be required in order to, you know, really protect biodiversity and protect uh, habitats to an extent that is consistent in the long term with uh, you know, a, a healthy and sustainable coexistence of our species with the other 20 million species on the planet. Uh, those numbers can be, you can quibble about, you know, a few million more, a few million less, but, uh, but, but that seems to be the consensus out there. So three to four hundred million, and how, do, how does that compare to what is being put into conservation today? Uh, we came up with a number of roughly fifty billion dollars yearly going to, that go into conservation. Uh, eight, roughly eighty percent of that is from public sources and from philanthropic sources. Maybe twenty percent of that is coming from private investors. Okay, so 50 billion that is going into conservation, three to 400 million, which is the need if we're really going to maintain a healthy and sustainable environment in the long term. How do you feel that? Hold on yeah. a second. A happy story? How is this a happy story? Uh, that's, uh, the punchline is coming. Um, <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> there is a, uh, that gap uh, could be filled with if that gap, put it this way, if that gap is filled with private capital, it could be a happy story. Why? Because we looked at the total amount of new and invested capital every year that becomes available. And the gap between what goes into conservation and what conservation needs are is roughly 1% of all new and reinvested capital globally on the part of retail, high net worth, and institutional investors. So if we could actually direct a just 1% of all of this new capital and reinvested capital to double bottom line activities that would have a good, a positive environmental impact and would uh, 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 pro provide some returns for investors, we could tackle the problem. So give us an example of what is, uh, in your view, a double bottom line investment that, that fits that bill. I mean, because, uh, that by those numbers, a whole lot less than 1% is being invested uh, in, in this because it's 20% of that 50 billion number, right? right? Yeah. So uh, I'm not very good at math, so I'm not even going to attempt that, but it's a whole lot less than 1%. It's probably a tenth of that. Right. Um, yes, definitely a, a, a lot less than that, but a few examples. I mean, uh, some of them uh, we have heard about today, some of them we will hear about shortly, but anything from sustainable commodities, sustainable forestry, uh, um, offset markets, payments for biodiversity uh, uh, services, um, any of a number of different fields where, uh, as the markets develop, we may come closer to filling that gap. But 
admittedly, it's a huge gap, and it's a, huge, and it's a gap that will only be filled if private capital is deployed through intelligently designed financial structures and good business models that allow private capital to really be So, I mean, invested. I think we would all love it to see 1% of that money end up in, in, in conservation or something like that. Um, what do you think is, uh, give us one thing that's missing. What, what, what would change it? Did the report highlight uh, activities that could be done that would uh, help that 1% come in? Any number of, uh, the, uh, of points, things that you could point to, but if I had to point to one thing, I would say the deployment of good structuring muscle uh, and people and who have the willingness and the ability to structure good financial transactions that will have this double bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, it, getting to where we are on the impact investing side, on the, on the social side of things, has taken a very long time and a, and a huge amount of thinking. There have been all sorts of obstacles, regulatory, financial, etc. And uh, it's through the deployment of goods structuring muscle that we can get there. Mm -hmm. Necessary so, but not sufficient. Right, and, and I guess that answers a little bit my question of why is a big bank like Credit Suisse interested in this? Is it because you want to help move that 1% uh, to conservation or are you being, are you being asked by your clients to, to move in this direction? Absolutely. What's the I would say the number one motivation is uh, a, an ever-increasing expression of desire on the part of clients, particularly high net worth individuals, uh, for product that will allow them to invest not necessarily all, but at least a certain part of their, their wealth into products that will have uh, you know, positive impacts that go beyond the financial part. So this panel is about evolution, so have you seen a change in that respect? Uh, I have. I have. Uh, I should emphasize that Credit Suisse is relatively new to the, uh, to the impact space. Uh, but but even during that time, yes, we have seen. Uh, we what do you think has evolution. changed? Why, why is why is why are your clients asking for this? Is there some something you can point to? Any ideas? I, nothing in particular that comes to mind immediately that is causing this. But the fact is, it's happening. There used to be a mentality, that, and and still the prevailing mentality is: you make your money this way and then at the end of the year you take part of your returns and you don't donate them to good causes. There's a clear trend towards moving away from that schizophrenic approach to investing and trying to align your values with your own investments more than there used to be. It's no longer about making money any way you can and then uh, 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 you know, paying for your sins at the end of the year by making some small donation. More and more, it's about investing in things that are good. Interesting. I, I, I mean, I think if we take a look, Susan, I wanted to turn to you because um, Packard, uh, as well as Moore Foundation, are working with TNC, with Echo Asset Management Partners, and with JP Morgan on producing a kind of a report that goes into the numbers. How much is actually going into conservation impact investing? Um, uh, it's kind of a follow-up to the report that Credit Suisse and others did, which looked at the problem. This is saying, okay, well, what's happening out there? What are people doing? Um, and, and I think John's painted a sort of good news, bad news story, right? Good news, there's a lot of potential. Bad news, there's not a whole lot of money going in. And when he says $50 billion, even if you take all of the social impact investing money that, that JP Morgan in another report on social impact investing, which I should add didn't include conservation impact investing at all, that number was $10.6 billion uh, last year. So well short of the 50, well, well, well short of the $400 billion. Um, can you give us some, some highlights uh, on the report and, and also talk a little bit about the role that you see for Packard, institutions like Packard in this process? 
Yes, definitely. And I think, you know, building on John's point, I think certainly it is true that conservation investing is both in terms of scale of dollars, in terms of being, as John said, a decade behind. Uh, you know, I, I would agree with those things. I think, you know, this, uh, you know, the collective that came together around commissioning this report, I think, um, really saw, though, that there is a glass half empty and a glass half full, you know, side to that story. And so um, I think we felt it was important to document. There's been a lot of um, studies, there's been a lot written, there's been a lot of attention, a lot of forums around how the social investing has grown. And I think, you know, we felt it was important to document the conservation investing side. And, you know, whether, I think when we look at the numbers that are coming out, uh, the, the number, we did a survey of a, a sample of conservation investors, uh, the number that's come out is 24 billion am I allowed to say that we haven't come out with a report yet but <laughs> uh, you know 24 billion over five years um, but of which a lot of it is development banks so it's really about two billion that's private investor capital so you could look at that number and, and we wonder how you know how are we all going to look at that number is that that is a limited number you know so you could you know look at that number and get depressed <laughs> or say impact investing you know is is irrelevant for conservation I, I personally don't feel that way I feel that that number is you know it's and early in the evolution. The other striking finding is just the, the rate of growth, and it looks like it's doubled, you know, over a five-year period, likely to double or more than that over the next five years. Um, I, I do think um, it, it is an opportunity of, of, you know, it's early. And so my hope is that it's early and also that um, when you look at the 22 billion, the other side, uh, development banks, I think there's really a lot of opportunity there to partner with either that 22 billion that's development banks and also the private sector capital that John alluded to, some of the structured products that you know remain to be created. Um, and so there's really a lot of uh, partnership opportunities across asset classes. And sort of turning to the other question you asked, Ricardo, about how Packard looks at this, I think that's really a lot of where we're uh, spending our time within our shop. which So we have a $180 million program for PRIs or MRIs. And I think what we're doing a lot of in the last few years is looking for those opportunities um, to scale new innovations. So to really use our capital to come in after it's been proved, after some of these innovations have been proven out and, and, and are ready to really scale and grow and to find those opportunities and, you know, provide growth capital. And I think, you know, there's more and more of that, I guess, Again, that also is a little bit of half empty, half full. I think that what we're seeing is versus five years ago when we were doing a lot of very sort of just bread and butter land transactions or, you know, very straightforward, we're seeing a lot more of creativity from folks like you, uh, at, you know, everyone who's here at SOCAP. I mean, there's just so much more creativity going on. That's the half full. I think the half empty is, in my view, there's a lot more capital right now than there is a, what I like to call absorptive capacity. I feel like being able to find investable, you know, places for it, um, at least from the investor side, and I know that certainly that could be a source of, of debate and discussion, and maybe can, Ricardo's can you, about to do that. Can you <laughs> give us a, an example of the types of new creative mechanisms that Packard is, is investing in? Sure. I mean, I think um, to give um, sort of thumbnails and then I can flesh out any of them, uh, you know, for example, we uh, invested in the, the spin-out of the a certification system for biofuels called the Roundtable on Sustainable Biofuels um, to create a market standard for biofuels. Uh, another example is uh, our investment in the Freshwater Trust, where um, the, basically they are designing an innovative uh, system for creating water quality credits using an environmentally sound, scientifically based system that um, is innovative in the market. So we've provided them with growth capital to really scale that up in the Pacific Northwest and hopefully nationally over time. Uh, and then I guess another example I would use is, is we're doing a lot with trying to, to find ways to layer our capital with other sources, to bring other sources. I mean, conservation has been driven by government funding, by donor funding, and really trying to find ways where there's other layered sources of capital. So like carbon credit funds, we were invested in the ECHO uh, Green Carbon Fund. We're actually just now, it's not approved, <laughs> but we are taking to our board a, a recommendation for a $5 million investment in the Althelia Climate Fund, which has been successful in Europe, <laughs> but has not yet gained traction in the U.S., and we're hoping to help them um, boost that um, 
if I have time for one more example or not. Sure. Go for well, it. the other one I was just going to say was Ecotrust Forest. That was one where we tried to use our capital as a debt layer to bring in private equity capital. So it's kind of creating a capital stack where mm -hmm. a foundation is more willing to take risk perhaps than a, than a private investor or a different type of risk or a different return. Yeah, so and I guess it's, what's interesting is I think that um, what we find is there's different tools for different transactions and a lot of times, so, so the um, cre taking more risk is actually not always the role. And so for example, in Ecotrust Forest, we actually um, do need to preserve our capital. So we have $180 million fund, so, and we need to preserve that over time. So, so um, we sometimes, for some things that are very bullseye, will come in with a first loss. But for example, in Ecotrust Forest, that's not really actually what was needed. In fact, the private equity investors, that's what they do, <laughs> is mm -hmm. take risk. And so actually coming in with the 1%, actually fairly more risk averse capital, but that just had a, the thing we do have is we have no profit motivation Lower at all. return. So a lower return. So right. we're able to sort of uh, juice up the returns is always the, you know, the, the Probably not don't so say elegant that. way to, to say it, and probably not yeah, the way the lawyer would like, but, but it's sort of to, to be that part of the capital stack that will enhance the returns for those private equity investors who actually can, are set up to take risks, but do need the return hurdles to be met. Peter, you, you've been at this longer than a lot of people, uh, looking at conservation finance from a variety of different hats. Uh, private hat, uh, public hat, uh, NGO hat. Um, I mean, talk to us a little bit about how you see things changing and where you would like things to go in the future, but perhaps start by telling us a little bit about your experience with Lime Timber and how that's evolved over the years. Well. Um I'm kind of short-sighted, so I can only talk in the millions, not the billions. Uh, but I, uh, I made the transition from the NGO world to the private capital, you know, money-grubbing world 24 years ago. And a lot of my friends uh, thought I was crazy, but it, it worked out quite well. Um, and what it really is is harnessing a lot more capital than will ever be available through philanthropy. So I'm a giant fan of Susan's program-related investment function at the Packard Foundation. In fact, I'm a fan of all PRIs anywhere. But uh, they really are there as leverage to grow the comfort for private investors to invest in this space. And so Lime Timber, Lime Timber became an impact-oriented manager without any impact investors. It's kind of the opposite about uh, how much of this happened. So in, in uh, 1990 or 1991, when I joined Lime Timber, uh, forest land continues to be available to invest in. It was a little easier 24 years ago. But uh, one of the challenges was uh, to kind of change the behavior, behavior of private investors. And you probably could do that through counseling, but you can also do that. I know some that would be pretty resistant to counseling. Yeah, okay. So, well, we didn't take that tack anyway. So um, the way we change behavior, um, we started with our own behavior, but it's been mimicked or copied throughout the timberland investment industry now, is to bifurcate the ownership of timberland. So if you actually want to make a timberland investment versus a path of development investment, uh, you either have to find a remarkably stupid seller who just wants to sell their timberland at its timber value, or you have to find a way to monetize the non-timber values in the investment. And the monetization mechanism in the United States of America and about 73 other countries is to buy some of the property right interests. In, in America, we call it a conservation easement or a conservation restriction if you're in Massachusetts. Um, in, if you're in Quebec, you call it a conservation servitude. But basically, some of those rights uh, were acquired by land trusts or by public agencies, and they bend or influence the behavior of the party that holds the balance of those rights. So the best way to understand this is Lime Timber just wants to be a timberland investor. We never meet any stupid sellers anymore. Any un We're paying the same price that every other timber investor wants to pay. Most of them are also real estate developers. 
We don't want to do that. I could not go home to my wife. I wouldn't be able to explain it to my children. I would lose all my friends at the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Land. So, the ones uh, you haven't lost already. Right. That's right. Uh, so anyway, uh, but cut me off if I go too long. No. <laughs> so, uh, but it, what, what really changed over the last 24 years is we now no longer just go to conferences and give presentations or listen to presentations. We actually get commitments from institutions and families. So first five years, there was, there was not a nickel of impact investor money at the Lime Timber Company. By 1995, we had a single impact investor, the Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation in New York City. Our last fund, uh, which is vintage 2010, 41% of the capital in that fund came from impact investors that totaled $61 million. So out of a $160 million fund, two-fifths of the fund came from impact investors. Obviously, we're not doing anything about solving the gap between $50 billion and $300 billion, but we're, I'm actually seeing real dollars being committed by real people, real families, real institutions, foundation endowments, small college endowments, secondary school endowments, our very first public pension fund uh, in our newest fund, but uh, they are actually getting the rationale of why it makes sense to become impact investors. And they're not doing it because there's a charity motivation whatsoever. We're making market rate returns, but they're finally getting the fact that they can do What do you do think that. has changed? I mean, what do you... I think the fact that it's no longer just lime timber, that there's actually a cohort of private equity structured investment managers. I think there, um, it may be over, I may be overselling this, but the fact that we actually now have some common reporting schemes about impact, like the IRIS metrics from the Global Impact Initiative, uh, I think the fact that we have a track record. So we're raising our fifth capital pool now. Uh, I think it's challenging if you're a startup. It's challenging if you're in the, you know, 10 to $50 million space. But at the couple of hundred million dollars space, I think people are ready for that. And how, how, many, how many assets do you have under management now? Uh, it's, what, it's Thursday, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, How's Timber doing today? <laughs> Timber, did, uh, Timber did really well today. No. Um, we own uh, exactly 1.2 Rhode Island's worth of land, about 700,000 acres. Uh, and in terms of money, can you share any details of how much assets? Uh, yeah, we have about $350 million of assets under management. Did you want to get in here, Susan? Yeah. Well, I was just going to um, say one other dimension to the question you just asked about what's changed. And I think one thing certain we've observed um, is what's changed also is the way people define themselves. And Peter was kind of alluding to that. Um, I do think even in the last three years, um, we've gone from a world that was more what John said, the sort of bipolar world of are you profit seeking or are you impact seeking? And I think as we co-invest in funds now, we actually are just going through an analysis right now as we look at whether the, you know, to classify our affiliate investment as a PRI. And we tried to go through analysis. Okay, is this a profit seeking investor, our other co-investors, or are they impact? And they were all, you know, pretty much, really every single one were really along this very fuzzy spectrum of they had some, you know, they were either a finance first fund within a strategic fund or they were strategic within a finance first or they were, and it, it, I just think even in the last three years, uh, there's been real, uh, and, I, and I'm blurring in a very good way of, of sort of more holistic investing that's, that's happening. So then in, in addition to the, you know, the, the ground up from the investment side, I do think there's a real, uh, a, a psychological shift on the investor side as well. So it seems like we're coming to an interesting curve or an inflection in the curve where the capital is becoming more aware, there are more products like lime timber, et cetera. Where, where does the, the Nature Conservancy stand in all this and how are you seeing the evolution of conservation finance? And I know you just helped create with a major bank, JP Morgan, this entity called NatureVest, uh, which ECHO is also uh, involved in. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and about how you see the shift and where you would like to see it go into the future. Great. Thanks, Ricardo. NatureVest, there's a lot of information in the creation of NatureVest as a, as a data point, and it was created through a partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase uh, to take what is a really strong transactional history at the Nature Conservancy in 
all 50 states in the U.S., 30 plus countries around the world, and in a sense roll that up and try to get much more disciplined and proactive about creating a pipeline of products that could go out to market. The Conservancy brings to the evolution of conservation finance, I think, some very unique attributes because of our history and our DNA as a transactional organization, but as a conservation first organization. And we have a, a one thing we have is a very large staff of scientists. Uh, about a half of the Nature Conservancy are PhD scientists. They are passionate about making sure that the impacts are uh, well understood, but also uh, 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 tracked and followed, and, and that investments are built around kind of that conservation outcome. Mm, I'm thinking transactional PhDs. It's kind of <laughs> we have we it's 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 a it's a really it's a, a day to day. It's a very fun tension for for us in the organization because I, I sit there and I sit and I work with my team to tra to structure uh, transactions. And then I have to take those to the PhDs and say, does this pass the sniff test? What else do we need to know about these? And, and what I would say is that NatureVest and this relationship with JP Morgan Chase and leveraging kind of TNC's platform is that in a number of these areas, like investing in natural infrastructure or green bonds or fisheries, there's a really interesting and compelling science component about understanding what happens, for example, if you follow a fishery that's maybe been overfished, how long before it recovers and could potentially return money to investors. And does that happen on a five-year time frame, which is to sort of a nice time frame for investors, or does it happen over 30 years? Similarly, in natural infrastructure, sort of what are the issues, and I know ECHO is very involved in this work, but what are the issues around uh, the trade-offs that get made around different types of infrastructure? Is there a sort of deep green versus a light green? And we're in a position to both kind of help understand what those trade-offs are, uh, and, and structure products around them that are ultimately investable. So the idea behind NatureVest is to structure these products, come up with these products that, that can, can then be taken to the market and then people like JP Morgan or Credit Suisse or others could, could come in and invest in? Part of the vision around NatureVest is to get involved in that early deal structuring uh, investment creation, leverage that platform, and then hopefully in some ways bring those almost as pilots to market but that, that success for NatureVest is actually that other, other folks at scale are doing this. So we, we may have de-risked, for example, natural infrastructure, hopefully with some help from Echo uh, <laughs> and funding from Packard, uh, de-risk de them to the point where, the, the, where they are well understood as investment vehicles. You know what kind of the science outcomes are, or the conservation outcomes, you know what the risk return profile is around the investing, and that they become investable for uh, commercial investors. So um, to interrupt Eric, but with an example, Lime Timber also invests in wetland mitigation and stream banks. And uh, we got into this because we watched NGOs make wetland mitigation bank investments and stream bank investments. And our first one was a partnership with the Virginia chapter of the Nature Conservancy when they had essentially tapped out internal resources to do this, but we had watched them do it three other times and we then became their private investment partner for the fourth investment. So it's really already happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, talk a little bit about the experience, guys. I know the California chapter of the Nature Conservancy and Nature Conservancy generally has a tremendous wealth of experience of investing uh, capital in both land, real estate, timber, even fisheries in ways that, that, that generate the conservation results. I mean, can you talk uh, about some specific examples where you've seen that uh, achieve conservation results as well as investable returns from the private sector? Yeah, it's a, it's a really f a f fair and good point. On the West Coast, the Nature Conservancy is the second largest owner of ground fish fishing quota. Uh, so that includes all commercial investors. We have bought and sold uh, 1.5 million acres of property. We actively manage 500,000 acres of property. So in terms of transactional experience, we have lots of it. Um, often it was um, not done in sort of this structured way. So um, as an example, though, of, of I think where an organization like the Nature Conservancy and our partners, and we have some very generous and wonderful partners who help us do this work, are uh, effective is with this ground fish story, which was 10 or 15 years ago, uh, with funding from uh, foundations, we went in and we bought permits, boats, and quota pounds uh, and retired them from the, uh, a big piece of the ground fish fishery on the West Coast. We then uh, re-licensed them out with a bunch of conservation restrictions about when and where you could fish, 
what kinds of fish. We created, with the community's help, some restrictions on, uh, well, some mechanisms like a risk pool that basically just kind of allowed the fishery to be much better managed. And we worked, uh, and I think we should talk a little bit about this, but we worked on a policy angle to restructure how the governance around that fishery uh, so that it wasn't a completely open access fishery. And then this last year, we completed the first divestiture of that quota share back into one of the communities that had sold us the quota in the first place. And they bought it, uh, uh, um, they, they paid real money for that. Uh, it was funded by a, a commercial uh, lender. And it's a great example of kind of early engagement involvement by a nonprofit, uh, changing kind of the, the rules of the game, putting some structure around it from a regulatory standpoint. And our expectation now is that that model of reforming a fishery this way becomes something that is investable. Are, are you worried uh, that if, if we get to the kinds of numbers that John's talking about, you know, $400 billion going into conservation, and you know, the, the wolves of Wall Street, like uh, some of the people in this panel and others come in and they start, you know, doing their usual rape and pillage of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of a fishery, is that going to affect the conservation results or do you think we can, we can find ways to, to you know, harness the Gordon geckos of the world and the greed is good philosophy and, and, and still achieve conservation? Yeah, look, I think this is a, a great question, and I, and I live it daily because I walk into the office and I wear a bunch of hats. I have this, this PhD in economics. I guess it doesn't make me a good guy, but it makes me one of the scientists, sort of. Uh, but then I'm also the one who's responsible. Uh, economics is not a real yeah, I'm science. I'm responsible Come for on, bringing, bringing these deals to the, to the organization and working with people. There's some folks in the audience with NatureVest. Uh, but sort of bringing these deals to the organization, and so I get a lot of pushback from the scientists. And I would say, yes, this is a big concern for us. Uh, which is sort of the watering down of the conservation outcomes uh, around these investments. And so uh, we think about this sort of, I think green bonds are a great example of it, which is I see a real role for the Nature Conservancy and for kind of rigorous science at determining what is an appropriate conservation outcome around green bonds. And let's at least make sure that investors know what the trade-off is that's being made between the financial return and the conservation outcome and getting really kind of precise and clear about that so that you know, not every green bond is equal. Yeah, it's interesting you should mention green bonds because I think it's, it is indicative of this transition, right? There are all these bonds, billions of dollars being transacted now where people are putting money into largely renewable energy. It's uh, most of the green bonds we've seen, 95, probably more than 95% have been about renewable energy. And some you could say are, you know, so light green they're approaching <laughs> some other color uh, uh, and some are truly green but there is also a signal that's out there that billions of dollars of demand for these bonds is happening so you know can we harness that to achieve some of the conservation results that the TNC pushes for Susan are you worried that this uh, uh, if, if there is this influx of money that it will change the, the landscape out there well, I definitely think that, uh, you know, the, the sort of what's been branded the impact imposters, um, I, th I think is a real uh, phenomenon. And I do think, you know, or the light, you know, the barely light green uh, investments. I think that what we strive, and this gets back to, you know, the role of foundations, of NGOs, I think to be able to be that, I think and that's... And government, right? We haven't talked about it, that's but true. you mentioned it. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a very good point. And I think, you know, as we think about the roles in the capital stack, part of it is in, you know, what's the return, what's the risk, but then part of it also is to help to be the arbiter of being able to do that deep scientific analysis that Eric is talking about. I know that when we come to investments, for example, the investment uh, that we're recommending, again, isn't approved yet, but in Althelia, part of what we're trying to do is to say we've diligenced this from a programmatic perspective. We've delved into all of their ESG. We, we can kind of help, you know, be that arbiter and, and be a lead investor so that other investors can look to us and our diligence around what is really the impact and, and programmatic uh, impact of these investments. In terms of your question, Ricardo, I think we have to worry about having good regulation in place and good compliance. As long as we have that, I'm very pragmatic about these things. As long as the outcomes are the right ones from a social point of view, I worry l a little bit less about the motivation of the investor than many people do. I think if the ultimate social outcome is a positive one, if what is primarily motivating the investor is 
the greater good of society or of the planet, or it is his or her bottom line, I, I don't get too worked, about, too worked up about it. We want the right outcomes, and that's the key thing. And I mean, it's interesting that the, the study you were involved in, John, said 80% of the money that's going into conservation now is some mix of governments, multilaterals, and, and philanthropy, right? Uh, our study that we are involved in on Conservation Investors said 90% of the money that is actually going into impact investments and granted. You know, this was a very limited uh, survey. It was a very limited pool of, uh, of people we asked because we didn't have you know, the time or the resources to really go everywhere. We probably didn't touch a lot of impact investors in, in Europe, but this is a, a first step to quantify what the size of it was. But it found, too, that 90% of that money was coming from bilaterals and multilaterals, organizations like USAID, organizations like you know, the development aid agencies of Sweden, Norway, UK, US, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can you talk, John, a little bit about the role of government in this space? What, you, what do you see as the right role for government in encouraging us moving towards that $400 billion that you talked about? As a banker and a biologist, I may not be the person best qualified on this panel to talk about government, but I, personally, I think government is absolutely crucial. Government and regulations passed by government are what create markets. If we did not have governments and we did not have regulations, we would not have markets because the market is nothing but the natural working out of the game that is played in the regulatory framework that is in place. Uh, so the rule of... So they're the referees of the game. In, in they, the they write the rules and they referee the game. And many in the private sector, there's a tendency in the private sector to kind of you know, downplay the importance of government and to, you know, react negatively to almost any kind of regulation. And I think personally, and I'm not speaking for my institution, I'm speaking as an individual, I think that's terribly unfortunate because mm -hmm. if we don't have good government and we don't have good, strong, predictable, intelligently developed regulation, it's very difficult to play the game of the market. Right. Uh, just to give two examples from, from our own experience at ECHO, we have a, uh, a carbon fund that, that Packard is an investor in, and you know, there would not be a carbon fund if there wasn't a carbon market, and there would not be a carbon market if the limits on emissions had not been set by government. So what the carbon market is essentially doing is taking a public good that hasn't been, hadn't been priced and it's turning it into you know, something different where you can set limits on it. Another example, we're looking at fisheries investments, learn, trying to learn from the TNC experience and other experience, and we're trying to figure out where we can put private capital and create investable solutions that will lead to sustainable fisheries. We're finding it very difficult to do that in places where there aren't things like quota fisheries, where the government hasn't set up limits uh, on the sustainability. So we believe that the government plays a fundamental role. Uh, but, but but maybe you can chime in here, Peter, and talk a little bit about your experience. Well, you know, it, it, it certainly levels the playing field a bit. Um, you know, we work predominantly in, in the U.S. We've made uh, a total of one investment outside the U.S. in Canada. But uh, the reality is... Oh, don't get too crazy now, Peter. Right, I know, <laughs> yeah. It was Quebec. Which is crazy. Um, okay, that counts. Yeah. That counts. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> But think about the fact that we're monetizing the real estate development potential through the sale of a conservation easement over a working forest. If you have no zoning and a landowner can do whatever he or she can possibly imagine, that easement is going to be more expensive. So more public resources and a little bit of philanthropic resources will go into compensating the landowner for the purchase of that easement. If you're in the Adirondacks, one of maybe seven or eight places in the United States of America that has what I would call robust re regional land use regulations, easements are far less expensive uh, because the development potential has already been modified through a public regulatory scheme. So that's how we're seeing it. 
mean, I, I, frankly, I, I would challenge anybody to, to find really good investments in the U.S. only that don't have a, a, a good, strong governance or regulatory structure. I mean, I, I think the laws in the U.S. around property rights are what enables the lime timber model. I think the existence of the Pacific Fisheries Council is what enables the transaction I described around fisheries. And I would say the lack of that in some cases, like around cap and trade and carbon, is somewhat hindering that market. The uncertainty, for example, of what, what is happening post-2020 in the California carbon market, I think, is holding a lot of people back. What I would also, though, say is there are non-governmental ways to achieve the same ends. So I really like the um, roundtable for sustainable biofuels. That sort of transparency, allowing the market to um, uh, make decisions based on disclosure of information, I think can in many cases be an appropriate substitute for that kind of regulatory oversight, or at least it's a good complement to the existence of a strong re regulatory oversight or governance rules. So I feel I've failed at my job because none of you have raised your hand and nobody has stood up and, 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 and wielded a chair and thrown it at us or something like that. I mean, come on, guys. All right, I'm here, Mike. Wait, can you wait till you get the mic because it's being recorded? Mike Van Patten, Mission Markets. Um, Ricardo, we've known each other for years. Quick question. So it seems that some markets lend themselves very well to structure, structuring asset-backed securities like tradable quota and so forth, and some do not like payments for ecosystem services because they're so localized and they're so esoteric. What is your opinion on is the hope of a market for payments for ecosystem services ever going to really evolve where it's actually investable, or is it too local and too you know, customized versus, let's say, transferable quota? Well, I'll, I mean, I'll take a, a stab at it and then pass it on to Peter, but I think that, that, that we are seeing it evolve, just maybe not in the way some of us had, had initially thought or hoped, right? So we are seeing, to some degree, the creation of, of explicit markets for ecosystem services in carbon, and, and, and people say the carbon market is dead, but if you take a look outside the U.S., and even in California here, the carbon market is alive and well. And then carbon markets are just not happening at the global scale. They're happening in California, in Quebec, in Korea, in Japan, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Europe. So it's going down to, to what I call the, the highest effective level of sovereignty that we have, because globally we have no real sovereignty to decree and set these standards. But at the same time, there's another way this is happening, right? So the other issue we're working on beyond uh, carbon or forestry is uh, green infrastructure. So how do you use green technologies, natural systems, to deliver clean water, stormwater management services to cities? Cities are desperate for these services. Just their only solution until now has been the traditional gray infrastructure. They're spending not millions, but billions of dollars in this infrastructure. If we can channel some of that into the provision of ecosystem services from natural infrastructure, that's, that's a, in my view, a payment for ecosystem services, just developing in a very different way than some of us had hoped. Peter? Well, I was going to say the same thing about uh, sort of urban green investments, but uh, look at wetland mitigation banking investments. Uh, that follows a national rule. Um, it's the part of the Clean Water Act and it's the 404 permitting under the Clean Water Act that drives public parties, private parties, under a no net loss of wetlands scheme to invest uh, in making up for the wetlands that were harmed. Uh, we are actually, Lime Timber does this, Ecosystem Investment Partners does this, New Forests does this, there's, there's probably 300, 350 million dollars of investable capital in the U.S. focused on that payment for ecosystem services right now. Mm -hmm. And it's a three to four billion dollar market yeah. annually. Um, so, are there, do, any more questions? I mean, how much time do we have? Like five minutes. Not a lot of time. So, we'll take uh, two more questions, and then I'll ask one final question of the panelists over here, back in there. Hi, Wendy Richards, and I'll ask my question as a private investor. So um, I have a pretty clear idea from this morning's panel what I could do with my next investable dollar if I go to Lime Timber. This panel is about the future, so instead of going to Lime Timber and committing today, if I hold back on that dollar, or perhaps you can argue I should come to you, 
why should I save that dollar and wait for JP Morgan or Credit Suisse? What exactly are you going to provide in these products? Like very specific, what would the investor be getting in your vision if you're successful in the partnership that you're looking to do and in the work you're doing? What will we be investing in? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, take a crack at this one. As examples, though, of products that we are developing at the Nature Conservancy, uh, one is that last year we launched a conservation note uh, that was uh, a $25 million offering uh, that was then uh, used and invested by the Nature Conservancy in a variety of projects. We're structuring investments in fisheries globally outside of the United States for, as Ricardo mentioned, the recovery of those fisheries we're structuring a fund in Latin America that would provide loans to farmers in post-conflict areas to convert from kind of monoculture beef ranching to silvo pastoral systems that are much more complex systems that are also better for the environment and way better economically. Uh, we're looking at investments and funds in natural infrastructure, in carbon, uh, in water rights in Australia. So each of these things would be an investable fund uh, that we would be structuring that would be in a portfolio of things another type of real asset with a different kind of risk return profile than the other ones uh, that if you were looking at it as a retail investor uh, you might think that you, you, you want to have a portfolio built around that particular profile. And I think what, what's interesting here is that you, you mentioned a lot of different types of investments. I think to answer your question, what would you be getting, I think there's a dual return, right? There, there's whatever the rate of return is for that particular investment. And, you know, the ones we've seen go anywhere from on the low end, 2% 2 per, 2 IRR, all the way on to the higher end, you know, 20-something or 30-something IRR in the best of cases. But at the same time, you have, if, the, if it works and it leads to more sustainable fishery, you have a sustainable fishery outcome or a sustainable water use outcome or, or whatever the outcome is. You wanted to jump in, John. But if I understood the question correctly, it's uh, do you wait for JP Morgan or Credit Suisse or do you go with Lime Timber uh, and why oh, would... absolutely wait for Credit Suisse, right? <laughs> Well, I would actually that it's a lot less about the institutions because, after all, a lot of the large financial institutions have open in, uh, platforms, open architecture platforms. Products like Lime Timber may end up being put on the uh, uh, investment platform of J.P. Morgan. Uh, what financial institution, large financial institutions can provide is some additional structuring muscle, uh, can provide some scale. And what I think is key is because of the, the depth and extent of relationships that these institutions have with high net worth individuals, it can intermediate between interested investors and between the lime timbers of the world. And yes, some of these institutions will develop their own products as well. But uh, I view the role is not antagonic to, but rather complementary to the lime timbers. So we had one more question up here. Um, no. No, it's uh, up here. We had, she had her hand up before. I'll come back to you afterwards. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lana Raymond. Um, I love the idea of being able to invest in a Nature Conservancy note like a treasury bill. Um, could you speak to the, um, earlier you were talking a little bit about uh, how green the investment is, light green, dark green, et cetera. Where can the investor look in the future for information about the level of greenness? Who's going to be the authority to rate the greenness of an investment? So, you know, like, uh, you know, a theme of our panel is so we're, we're still nascent on that. But I think there are some answers coming forward. Um, there is a, the, the gin you may be um, familiar with has created something called the iris the impact reporting uh, investment standards. I think I've got that right. And um, so uh, several of us on this panel, um, we actually um, sponsored and funded an effort to build out the conservation impact metrics within IRIS. So IRIS, as with many things impact investing, the social investment <laughs> metrics were very well built out. I think several of us saw a need to really make sure that the conservation metrics were beyond just 
number of hectares. <laughs> so, so we had a working group. There's a rigorous process. And so those are now on the IRIS platform to be used. So that it's a start. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't think everybody's using them yet. But, but if more customers say, we want to see how you're meeting these standards, I think that's a big step. I do think there is a role, you know, for instance, in this whole green bond discussion of a third party like TNC or somebody else going out there and saying, yeah, this is green and this, you know, less so, um, uh, in order to put some, some sort of standards. I mean, we got this in organic, we've got this in fair trade, you know, Rainforest Alliance. I, I can see it coming in the investment world. And now with the standards that Iris has, I think that's a, that's a, good, uh, a good first step in that direction. So one last question back there. And your last answer may be helpful on this. Um, in, the, in the transactions you discussed, I'm thinking how does uh, imposition of conservancy goals actually improve the value of your asset? So I think it's a little counterintuitive to me that imposing these restrictions actually makes the fishery more valuable. So when you have these pressures to produce returns, maybe this measurement is the answer, but, but help me out. Am I, am I evaluating that correctly? Yeah, let me, let me speak to this, and then I'm happy to have other folks on the panel talk about it, too. In the case of fisheries, one of the biggest challenges is open access, and that as fishermen are competing with each other for a very scarce remaining asset base, that they overfish. So they're fishing the, the fishery well beyond what is sustainable uh, to a level that is harmful to that fishery and also to the ecosystem around it. So the imposition or the layering of something like, in this case, the Pacific uh, Council, uh, Fisheries Council, was to impose a set of rules around access to that fishery and allow the Nature Conservancy and partners to put these restrictions on how you would fish onto that fishery and actually, and actually um, assign the property right, which was previously not assigned, to the fishermen and to the communities who could then own it as quota share and by owning it as quota share, then they could manage it much more sustainably because there was incentive uh, to do so. And I think that story holds true across a whole number of different assets about assigning the property rights and then having the ownership of those property rights established. Now, there is a sort of flip side to this, which is that ownership does also come with some unintended consequences that we were very concerned about in that particular example, which is that we didn't want uh, industrial scale fishermen acquiring all of that property right and over well and fishing that fishery to its maximum because there would be significant kind of social impacts along the fisheries and the coastline in those communities and so part of the regulatory structure was about designing uh, some rules that, that set maximum amounts of that that quota that any one organization could own so I think it's that kind of thoughtful um, it is sort of it's not exactly market making but it is sort of expressing society's preferences through regulation that I think is important as you put together these structures. And having an organization like the Nature Conservancy that has a strong kind of policy skill set and connections and can, can exert that influence and working with our partners like Packard and others to um, have that dialogue at a, in some cases, a national or a global level, we view as very important to make sure that those unintended consequences are, are, are well considered and thought out. Yeah, I mean, I think that the way, the way I look at it, I think there is a fundamental problem, right? We do not, in our economic system, value some of these ecosystem services. We've had this huge blind spot for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, because it's not valued, uh, planting soy or planting palm is more, quote unquote, valuable than maintaining a forest. So I do think at the heart of it, we will, over time, need to fundamentally change our economic system to add this value. Uh, I guess to use a tech metaphor, I think we're operating on, you know, Windows 9, 1892, uh, uh, as, as opposed to, to where we need to be in a world where, you know, you have Twitter and Facebook and all these other things, right? Imagine if you were working in Windows 95 in today's world, you know, you'd see that blue screen of death way too often. And I think the problem is the rules were written at a time when what was important, what was uh, scarce, was capital and labor, not natural resources. 
but we're transitioning into a world where natural resources are scarce. And at being scarce, they will become valuable. And that transition is in a potential for uh, increased profit. And you see it in, in, the, in the fisheries. As they become scarcer, you know, there is that potential. If we don't get into this tragedy of the commons situation where everybody's chasing the last fish, if we can give it some breathing room to recover, that is potential value. I mean, you just look at the recovery of fisheries if they are, if they are left untouched. That's a classic financial J-curve that you could invest in and make profits off if, if you did it right. The question is, how can you do it right? So I know that I'm, I'm being like, uh, told to get off here or else we're going to be pulled off with a hook. But um, uh, before we do that, I wanted to ask one last question of each of our panelists. And that's a very simple question. If there is one thing you could do to achieve that 400, 500 billion dollars for conservation, of which a huge chunk of it would come from private capital, what would you do and, and how would you achieve it quickly? The single most important thing we could do is to try to get individual investors to recognize that their own investment choices, where they put their wealth, where they put their pension money, has an impact on the world and to align where they put their money and their pension uh, funds with their values. And in some cases, that may mean some people putting uh, uh, their, their pension money into coal companies. I think in a large majority of, uh, uh, of cases, it will, it will have positive effects. We need to be less schizophrenic about how we invest, and we have to bring our values and our uh, investments closer together. Well, I just say here, here to what John said. The only, the only, only way I think I might attempt to phrase it slightly differently, and it's actually been licensed or trademarked by a wealth management firm here in San Francisco, is the con is the concept of full consequences. Uh, I think you alerted to the fact that we don't have an economic system that values natural resources completely. Uh, so if you're an investor, you really need either on your own or with great wealth advisors from J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Credit Suisse to have advisors who can really talk to you about the full consequences of your investment. And that would go a long way to getting that money there. Susan? I guess I would um, then turn to, I mean, we've talked about the investor side, and certainly I do think there are, you know, is capacity that's needed. But I actually think, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the absorptive capacity, I do think there's a lot of interested capital that wants to have an impact. And so I think, you know, I, I'm very heartened seeing what's happened here with SOCAP um, over the last few years and a lot more, um, you know, uh, hopefully just as much hope and aspiration, but I think a lot more actual deals <laughs> um, being represented. And so I think that's where my hope would be um, that there's just a lot more investable activities that have been structured um, and ready to be invested in um, to, to get to that scale. Yeah, I think I would echo this. I think we need more product, and to get there, in part, we're going to need uh, clearer regulatory rules and oversight that reduce the uncertainty in these markets. And I think just to leave it on a glass half full note, uh, one interesting thing that we are seeing happening is that they tell us there is about to be a 440 something trillion dollar transition of wealth from. The, the baby boomers to their heirs. Now this is, and, and also other research tells us that when people inherit money, they change their management styles and they change their managers. Uh, uh, interesting to note that children do it at about 80 something percent and, uh, and spouses, uh, women do it at 90 something percent. I don't know what that says. Uh, but, but the point is, there is a, an incredible opportunity here uh, in that transition of wealth to do it in a way that John was talking about, of, of aligning values with investments. Because I think, you know, this whole, this old world that by having an impact, you are giving up on returns, that uh, is not always the case. 
It can be the case, but it is not always the case. There are cases where you can get both returns, financial returns, and impact returns. And those are the ones we need to find. Those are the ones we need to structure. That's the kind of product I think we need to put out there to capture a portion, whatever percentage, is it 1%, 2% of that $40 trillion change of wealth. So uh, whatever we can do to, to capture some of that, I think, is really the, uh, the challenge for the next 10 or so years. But uh, a big round of applause for our, our panelists, and thank you very much.